Hello and welcome to Tim's BMW Repairs and Information. And due to popular request, I'm going out in the sub-zero temperatures with my diagnostic leads again. Yeah, we're going to diagnose using INPA the valve train on the N62 engine. Yeah, people get very worried about the valve train on the N62 because it does make quite a rattling noise, especially when you're giving it lots of beans and you quickly snap your foot off the throttle, then it does tend to rattle around quite a lot. So don't be too worried about that. Now the correct choice of oil makes a difference and on MeekNet and on YouTube I show the correct oil to use in the N62 to try and quieten down the valve train. But it still can be quite noisy. Now using IMPA diagnostics we can check how much wear there is in the valve train and that includes the timing chains themselves and the guides and the tensioner and so on. And for that information, we look at adaptations, just as we look at adaptations for fuel-air mixture problems in the engine. In the valve train, we can check for wear in those places with adaptations. It has a green band, and as long as, as the adaptations are within the green band, and there's one band for each of the four camshafts, as long as they're within that band and not moved off into the black, then you're okay. Now the adaptations, unlike the engine adaptations, which we expect to be zero in a perfectly running engine, the adaptations for the camshafts will increase over the life of the car. And with a car of my age, 14 years old and 125,000 miles, we expect to see some wear shown in adaptations, and we do. But as long as we retain within the green band, we're okay. Now it is going to change when, you change when you think about it because of course the camshaft and the sprockets are permanently timed together. There's no timing adjustment between those two on the sprockets. And the actual timing chain is done by the Vanos units and there's four Vanos units on the N62 engine. So how ad adaptations work is that the engine can measure the absolute uh, camshaft timing and if it's off by any certain amount, it will put a value into adaptations and move the Vanos to compensate for that, those wear parts. Now, that's important to know because with engine adaptations, we expect to see zero for a, the long term and the short term, multiplicative, multiplicative and the additive adaptations. They should re retain around about zero unless things are starting to go slightly wrong. Camshafts is different. You expect to see wear in the, as the timing chain stretches and so on. So don't be worried about it. As long as you stay within the green band for each of the four camshafts, you're fine. Now, because the valve lift controls the engine power, we'd expect to see the throttle valve just stay fully open, wouldn't we? Well, no, you don't. The throttle valve actually follows the valve lift. And it does that to create a vacuum in the inlet manifold. So the control of the throttle valve is actually to maintain vacuum in the manifold rather than to um, control the power in the engine. So when we have a look at the IMPA diagnostics for the valve train, we can check the throttle valve and make sure it's still moving around to create the correct vacuum in the inlet manifold. And it's quite interesting how the two work in concert with each other. Valve lift, of course, is quite small when the engine's idling or ticking over. For instance, the M62 engine, as in the 740 and my 840 and so on, has about five or six millimetres valve lift. How much do you think it is in the N62 idle? Well, it's 0.3 of a millimetre. Yeah, it hardly moves at all when you're at idle. And it does that for good reasons. As the piston comes down on the inlet stroke, the valve remains closed and then quickly pips open and closes again and that cre creates a vortex of a fuel and air mixture that swirls around, creates much better combustion, much more efficient and much more powerful. Now of course the 645 with its N62 engine, same capacity as the 740 and the 840, yet it creates something like 40 or 50 horsepower more. It's that much more efficient and it's all done with the valve lift. 
The downside, of course, with the first version of valve tronic, which is the valve lift mechanism, is that it's slightly noisy. It got better as they sort of created better versions of it. But don't forget, the valve train is noisy on an N62 and there's not much you can do about it. Other things worth mentioning, of course, is that uh, the, the, the valve lift is quite small at idle and it has to increase its valve lift quite substantially when you put your foot on the throttle and it has to do that quite quickly. And it's done by eccentric shafts, um, one eccentric shaft for each bank and one motor for each bank. And it really moves that eccentric shaft really quickly and we can see that on the diagnostics. And it's interesting to, do, to have a look at it working. Anyway, enough of the blurb. Let's get out in the, what is it, minus two, minus three centigrade today. It's absolutely freezing out there. And let's try and get some information. Right, let's get on with it. Right, so the first thing we do is select the model and this is the E64 6 Series with the 650 engine. So it's got an N62 V8 engine in it. So F5, off we go, F5, look at the engine. N62 for uh, ME9 for N62. Double click on that, get a couple of error messages really. Then we need read status, which is F5. And for the valve information, F6. And we go straight to F1. Okay, when we're looking at the top left here, here's the valve stroke. Now, because the engine, once it's warmed up, actually uses the valve stroke rather than the throttle body to control power, we see that the valve stroke's very low until we press the throttle. So here we go. Yeah, so there we go, that's the valve stroke increasing, so the eccentric shaft's moving and allowing the valves to lift further, and that gives us the power from the engine. So we've got both bank one and bank two, so here's bank one, here's bank two. And the important thing is, is we've got a value, this is where the DME thinks the valve stroke should be, which is 0.3 of a millimetre lift on the valves. And we can see on bank one, we've got 0.31 and bank two, 0.35. So pretty close, so that's what we want to see. We want to see the set point uh, to reflect what the actual valve stroke is on both banks. So we're not far out, that's fine, that's what we expect. Next row down, so here's a set point, next row down, actual value of the eccentric shaft. Now the eccentric shaft is what turns to increase the valve stroke. So when we're ticking over it's at a position where we only get 0.3 of a millimetre. It's a tiny amount of valve lift. It's a tiny little lift of the valves as the cam comes round. Of course we don't need any power when we're idling, just the engine's doing very little. So 0.3 of a millimetre is what we get. And that lift is controlled by the eccentric shaft position. So our eccentric shaft position is measured in degrees, gradient, and 18.3 uh, on both of them. So at least they're both the same. And you can see the eccentric shaft turn as we put our foot down. And just for the valve lift, we've got a set point for the eccentric shafts. So for lower value here, that's our set point. So we want the set point in on both of the eccentric shafts to be 18 degrees. And they're both around about 17.9 or so. So that's fine. So page one, F1, all looking great. And we can see that the, the valve stroke changes as we hit the throttle. Really interesting that page. F2. Now this is the ex actual camshaft positions as is controlled by the twin Vanos. So we've obviously got a cam chain coming up from the crankshaft. 
that goes to the cam sprockets and on each sprocket there's the Vanos and what the Vanos does is it's controlled by hydraulic power and from the oil supply and its actual control is electrical and it pulse width modulates a solenoid to put hydraulic power into the Vanos solenoids and what they do is they turn the camshafts in respect to the sprockets so the sprockets have a set timing, it's always the same in respect to the crankshaft, but we can change the timing of all four camshafts. And uh, so we've got information about the camshaft position on both banks. So that's the top line there, that's the actual valve positions. Again in uh, degrees, and you see they're hovering around about 100 degrees on the inlet manifold or the inlet camshaft and that will change if we want to provide more power uh, because we want to have the valve uh, timing to be a bit earlier so here we go and that gives you a good indication if your valve uh, your vein or system is working we can obviously see it is because the camshaft timing is changing as we put the throttle on and about 100 degrees is just about right, that's where they should be. So that's the top layer there, top values. Um, the actual value of the input bank 1 and bank 2 should be around about 100 degrees when you're idling. The next row down is the activation to the Vanos solenoid. So if the Vanos solenoid is being pulse width modulated, open and close rapidly and if we want to put more pressure into the Vanos uh, uh, units then we have to pulse width modulate them different and the activation input bank 1 and bank 2 is that input now you see it moves very quickly so I put my foot back down here we go this one and this one There we go, and then we got exactly the same for the exhaust valves, so we got the next row down. Here the actual value of output bank, bank 1 and 2. And you notice they very quickly change. And of course we got to have very quick response, unlike on the M62 where the Vanos sort of slowly meandered into a position. They have to move very quickly on an N62, provide that immediate power. So you watch the two lower values and you see those change pretty quickly. So those values we can see there, about 120 degrees for the exhaust valve train is just about right. So 100 degrees on the inlet, 120 degrees on the outlet. If you got those, everything's looking fine. Okay, just like the engine has adaptations, which we went through on one of the earlier videos, so do the camshafts. The camshaft um, and the Vanos unit is all controlled by hydraulic power from the oil supply and electrically controlled to the solenoids, uh, via solenoids. Now it knows what the, the degrees should be, so we've said for instance we had 100 degrees on the inlet manifold, um, to achieve that then the pulse width modulation to the solenoids has to be changed to achieve it and if it can't achieve it with the normal default values then it has to put adaptations on them and so the all these, the information on this page is all about adaptations of the camshafts. So if we have a quick look at the adaptations here, this is the exhaust valves, inlet valves on bank one, exhaust valves, inlet valves on bank two. And both sliders are well within the green. Now of course we get adaptations of things where, and one of the things which will wear is the cam chain and the sprockets and the tensioner and stuff like that. So don't be worried that the uh, camshaft, camshaft adaptations 
on smack, a smack in the middle, which is where they started off when the car was new. Now it is going to change, and um, on a car which's done 125,000 miles like this one, then we expect to see the camshaft adaptations changing slightly. But the most important thing is we're within the green uh, limit, so we're not in the red areas, which is too far advanced and retarded. We're in the green that's as good as we're going to get on an engine which has done 125,000 miles. So all of those four values are in the green, we're doing fine there, that's great. Right, F4, that's our throttle valve and throttle possession, uh, position information, so if I press on the throttle pedal then this page will see that happening and also see the uh, throttle valve open open and close. Now you would have thought with valve lift control on the N62 engine then the throttle valve will just be fully open and then every, all the controls done by the valve lift. But that can't be the case. We need a vacuum in the manifold to pull the blow-by gases out of the crankcase. So even though we're valve lift control the throttle valve has to close to a certain point to maintain a vacuum in the in the crank in the manifold. So that's why our throttle valve has closed to, uh, quite significantly to attain that manifold vacuum. So, given that information, we can see the throttle valve open as we press the throttle, which is this value here. This is my throttle pe uh, pedal position. So here we go. That shows the throttle valve opening and the throttle position changing as I press the throttle. That's the throttle body. So this is what DME is telling it to do. That's what it's doing. And they usually very close in value. This other bit here, the plausibility test, is for the throttle pedal. Now if you had a throttle pedal which went wrong, what might happen is it might get stuck on full throttle. So rather than just having a signal come from, it has two signals. It has the main one, and then we have a secondary one, which is used to check if the first one's actually working properly. So that's the plausibility test. And you see the two values change as I put my foot on the throttle. There we go, so that's all working fine, so you can compare those values to your own. Last one is the knock sensor values, which we've discussed before in other videos. The knock sensors are there to advance the timing further and further until you start getting pre-detonation, pinking or knocking, whatever you want to call it. And so we have to measure the knock values, that's really listening to each cylinder firing, and if we start getting knocking, which is pre-detonation, then we retard the timing slightly. So this is just a page of all eight knock sensors, or the signals from all eight, because of course there's only four and each one measures two cylinders. Uh, but then they're subdivided out to display all eight of them. There we go then, all done, and I'm glad to be in from the cold. It's absolutely freezing out there. Anyway, it was interesting to diagnose the valve train. I hadn't done it before, but it's interesting to see it all working in real life. We had a look at the valve lift, which was a minuscule 0.3 of a millimetre at idle. Yeah, very small altogether. And it's interesting to note, if the valve tronic system goes wrong, then it just puts a default a lift on all of the valves and then adjust the power with the throttle valve. And it's good to see that the actual valve tronic system was all working fine. After that we had to look at the camshaft timing and that's done by the four Vanos units. They're obviously all working fine and it was very interesting to see the activation values moving uh, because of course when you put your foot down we have to advance the inlet cam timing and when we take our foot off again, it reverts back to its original position. And so what the activation did is that you saw it pump fluid into the Vanos solenoid. And then when I took my foot off the throttle, it went back the other way before it resumed its original position. And it does that to push the Vanos one way, and then it goes the other direction to push it back the other way, and then returns to a position where it just holds 
the Vanos in a fixed position. So yeah, it's interesting to see all four camshaft Vanos units working. And then probably the most important page was the adaptations and I was glad to see that all four cams were in the green band and not into the red band, so the left and the right of the slider. And that means that everything's working fine as far as the Vanos system is working, but it does show, especially on my car with 125,000 miles, that there is some wear in the system. We're not bang in the middle anymore, but that's to be expected on an old car. The timing chains will have stretched to a certain degree and that is reflected in those values, but very happy to see they're still in the green. And then we had a look at the throttle control and interesting to see the throttle working in concert with the valve lift. And then we had a look at the knock values as well, but I covered that in a much earlier video talking about which grade of fuel is best to use for our V8s. Well, I think that just about covers it for this uh, session. So thanks very much for all the comments you put on my videos. I really enjoy reading them. And thanks for subscribing and I'll see you next time.